Let's sue me. Let's see. That's Diami. Who's the Washington County LUT? Uh, I think that's our um, tech support. Okay. That's, that's, yeah, uh, it's me, Mark. Mark. Helping us out. I think um, I think we're expecting Councillor Pace and Mayor Delane. And I think that's everybody. I, I'm not sure about Susan McLean. We didn't check with her. We're happy to have her if she can make it, but. Yeah, she's a little busy, I would guess, still, so. Yeah. We'll wait a couple more minutes and then kick it off. Well, I see that um, Mayor has joined us. Juan Carlos has joined us. That's good. I think um, Councillor Pace is the only one that we're waiting for. We could probably get started. Okay. All right. Mayor, would you like to jump in here and then we'll kick this meeting off? Of course, he might just be zooming back from work. You know, he has a job or something. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> so uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us here. We've got a lot of information to cover today. We're going to talk about, um, we're going to hear some uh, spousal strategies about uh, the, uh, the public input that we got. We got some, um, we're going to, go over those of us who made the three mile trek from Cornelius to Forest Grove. Just have some thoughts about that. Talk about maybe uh, next steps. Um, and we'll, I'll, I'll bring that up just a little bit later, but for right now, uh, I don't think we have any new members here, do we, Julie? Um, we do have Mike Marshall from Forest Grove. Oh, okay. Welcome, Mike. You wanna give us a little introduction? And figure out how to unmute this. Um, Mike Marshall, the city council, just got on in December. So um, just kind of learning the ropes here. All right. Uh, well, welcome, Mike. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we're, this is a pretty exciting project for all of us. It's one of those fun projects, you know, that uh, um, we actually have some, a little bit of funding for and things like that. So you'll hear more about that um, in a little bit. So, uh, Julie, you want to kick this thing off? Yep. Let's get started. Okay, you can see that. Um, so, Commissioner Willie went over the agenda. Thank you. Uh, got an idea. I think we also have some um, trail cross sections that'll be interesting. I'm not sure you mentioned, and we'll be talking about um, some management plan considerations as well. Um, most of you, this is familiar, but Mike is new, and it's probably always a good refresher. Um, we're working on the Council Creek, the east-west portion of the Council Creek Regional Trail you see in dashed green there, but it's part of a, a planned network of trails that will lead from the Portland metro area all the way to the coast eventually um, over time. So some of those trails are in place and some are just planned. Um, this trail will serve both recreational and transportation purposes and um, will connect from Dennis Street in Hillsborough to Douglas Street in Forest Grove which I remember because those are my brothers-in-law names, um, but along that green line there um, is the trail that we're talking about. And you 
I know are familiar with it. Um, a reminder of our timeline and funding. We are currently um, in the red triangle nearing nearing the end of our preliminary design phase of a one and a half million dollar regional flexible fund allocation grant. Um, it, it, it feels uh, well, we are kind of nearing the end where we're working fast and furious and uh, there's a lot of work going on still in this project. We'll be quickly moving into the next phase, which is final design and engineering. In fact, I believe the RFP for the final design portion might be going out as soon as next week. Um, that's coming very quickly. That's part of our $17.5 million raise grant that we have for basic construction of the trail. Um, we also have another $6.3 million regional flexible fund allocation grant for 25-27, um, and that is for enhanced crossings at the intersections along the trail. So we're in a pretty good place with some good um, sources of funding and, um, you know, on, on a quick timeline. So. Um, Hoping to start construction in 2025 and completing construction by 2029, hopefully closer to the beginning of 2028. Um, and these are kind of the key phases of the project. We're moving quickly toward the end, toward the design and engineering phase, and also in the corridor plan delivery and implementation. We'll talk a little bit more about that today. Also in that green square at the bottom, public engagement update, that's something that you're going to be hearing about momentarily. Um, we have some good um, information to report on that. And um, just to remind you, the last time we met in March, we made a key decision. The elected official steering committee approved the tax recommendation for the center alignment. Um, you've all kind of been through the drill. We looked at a lot of alternatives. I think Mike missed a lot of this, but we considered whether it made sense to push the trail to one side or another uh, in case we do have a high capacity transit project in this corridor at some point. Um, we came to the conclusion that it made the most sense to build the trail in the middle. Um, if a high capacity transit project does come, it is likely to be um, several years down the line and, and we can reevaluate at that point. The one place that um, we're still working on where the alignment will be is at Dairy Creek where the bridge is and um, we're, we're doing more investigation to determine what makes sense, whether it makes sense to reuse the existing bridge or build a new bridge. So um, a lot of work happening in the project kind of behind the scenes that we're not going to talk a lot about today, but doing a lot more environmental work and um, archaeological work and that kind of stuff to get more information about what needs to happen um, at the bridge location. I've been going through it pretty quickly. Any questions at this point? I mean, this is mostly kind of background information, so feel free to chime in. Um, wanted to give you an update of the community and agency engagement that has been going on since we last met. We've been pretty busy. Um, we had an online open house from April 14th through May 14th. Um, and that coincided with some in-person events. We had um, an in-person open house at the Cornelius Library on April 25th that was fairly well attended. I would estimate we probably had about 40 folks there. So um, we offered paper surveys as well as um, cards with QR codes and website links. So if people wanted to go take the survey at home, they could do that or they could take it on paper at the open house. Um, a lot of folks did both and we had posters and, and talked with a lot of people there. Um, some staff attended the Dia de los Niños event on April 29th um, with Central Cultural and that was a very well attended event. And I think we recorded almost 500 interactions with with um, community members at that event. So that was really, uh, I heard a great day. It was nice weather outside and 
um, really good event. I did attend the Forest Grove and Hillsboro Farmers Markets on May 10th and May 13th. Also, really nice weather, really nice talking to people about this project. They, um, it's a fun project to talk about and most people say it can't come soon enough. Um, and then we've had some agency engagement. Our last meeting of this group was March 20th. Um, we met with the Stakeholder Advisory Committee on April 11th and our Technical Advisory Committee last week. And then uh, a number of you participated in the right away walk on Friday, which we are going to have some time to talk about that a little bit later, but I wanted to get into the um, the community engagement update because Jake War is here from Espousal Strategies and he's got another meeting to get to. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jake unless there's any questions for me before we do that. Is there, a, um, is there still an open link for the, the survey? Cause I don't, I had never saw what the survey was. So I didn't know what were the questions or anything like that on there. Oh, um, oh, okay. No, it has closed. It was it closed on May 14th. Um, Jake's going to present some of the results for that. I'm sorry you didn't see it. We tried to um, reach out a number of ways. There was social media campaigns. I believe it was in some of the city newsletters. Um, so yeah, that survey um, has closed. Um, but we do have a website. There's information available there. You can sign up there for updates. I mean, you're obviously getting updates through this group, but um, we do provide opportunities for people to get updates. Anything else? Okay, I'll pass it over to Jake to tell us about the survey. Thanks, Julie. And Good evening, everybody. Um, so, and and I'm not in a huge rush. So, if you have questions, don't don't worry. Uh, I'm happy to to answer. I just uh, need to drop off by five forty five. But um, so, uh, as Julie mentioned, we conducted a survey as part of the online open house. It was just on the website. As people went through the information, they were then taken to to the survey. Pretty brief survey, a uh, handful of questions about the project, um, and then some demographic information. Um, so first of all, we we got a really good response from it. Um, overall, 776 responses. Uh, that includes both the online ones as well as the ones filled out um, on paper at our open house with the Cornelius Library and Dia de los Niños, like Julie said. Most uh, were Washington County residents, 85%. Um, got a decent number of folks who live, reported living near the tracks, near the future trail, about a third, um, about 15% said they work near the trail. Um, we got 23% who are people of color and 17% and with a disability. We know that uh, on, on the people of color front, that's not reflective of the county or the corridor, but that's exactly why we have conducted other kinds of, of outreach to reach those communities. We know that these surveys often don't reach uh, those communities like we would hope. So we that's why in, in, um, in over the past year, we've done focus groups and um, partnerships with uh, community-based organizations um, to try, try to reach those folks and get those perspectives. As far as as far as people who live with a disability, though, that that's actually a little bit higher than what you find um, in the population at large. So, which is good. We really want to obviously want to go for project that um, you know one of the values is accessibility, and um, it's good to to be engaged with folks uh, from that community. Next slide. So, the big a big um, takeaway here is support is huge for the project. Um, Almost, you know, almost unanimous support um, across the board, uh, really high numbers. So, you know, you add up right there at the top of, of all who took it, you add up that 61 and 21, 68 and 21, you're about 90% survey takers were were supportive, either, either very or somewhat. And high support was consistent for those who live by the trail, for those who work by the trail. And even a majority of folks who, on our, on our very first question, 
uh, we had an option of, of why are you interested in this project? And, and one of the options there was I had some concerns and they could provide what those concerns were. But even among those people who selected that, still a majority were supportive of the trail. Um, they just they just had some things to, to voice about it that I'll, that I'll get into in a sec. Next slide, please. So on that note, uh, support for the project, um, you know, we heard that folks see it as a valuable asset for the community, a uh, good transportation alternative between Hillsborough and Forest Grove, um, uh, recognition of the need for these types of amenities in the community, um, and, and acknowledging that both commuting and or transportation and recreation were uh, uh, desirable uh, uh, activities that folks wanted to do on the trail and, and a lot of interest in learning more. Um, you know, it's still so fairly early for folks. You know, sometimes people don't get engaged until there are shovels in the ground, but um, but we, we feel good. We've done pretty good job getting getting the word out so far. Um, so one quote here uh, that, that kind of exemplifies uh, the overall sentiment um, of those who were supportive. Regional trails are especially important in connecting communities, providing safe recreation experiences, and facilitating non-vehicular transportation options, which sounds kind of like a transportation planner uh, provided <laughs> that, honestly, um, but I uh, thought it was a great co quote to, to pull out there. Uh, it next very slide. Well could be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, there were some concerns about uh, the project and, and overwhelmingly consistently with those who, who did voice concerns. Um, it was it was related to safety and they kind of tied that with uh, potential encampments along the corridor. People mentioned, you know, don't want it to be the spring water corridor um, and, and things like that. Want to make sure it's well lit, et cetera. Um, so, so those sorts of things, people were, you know, they weren't always you know, oppose the project, like I said, because of that. They just wanted to have some of those questions answered of how it's going to be maintained, how the people who live on the corridor are going to be taken care of, um, and 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 uh, and such. Um, so again, another quote that kind of exemplifies that excitement, but a little bit of uh, uh, reticence, or or just you know wanting to wanting to know more to be assured that it's going to be safe and a good community asset that's well taken care of. Next slide. So we asked about um, how often folks thought they would use the trail and how they would use the trail. Um, so in the pie chart on the left there, uh, people who took the survey really expect to use trail pretty frequently. 40% um, said weekly or more. Um, and, and for people who live near the trail uh, or work near the trail, 60% said that they, they plan to use it weekly or more. Um, you have another 30%, 37% who said they'd use it every two weeks to monthly and 23% and less than monthly. There were a few uh, who took the survey who said they would never use it, but uh, you can count them on, on one hand. Um, as far as the, the reasons that people would use the trail, we specified in, in, in our options we provided, whether when we we're talking about walking or biking, whether it was for recreation or transportation. And so you can see how that laid out, you know, the, the three quarters of folks um, plan to walk on it for recreation, uh, about two thirds bike on for recreation, and then, um, you know, decent, decent numbers who also felt that it would be useful for transportation, either for tra accessing transit or just um, uh, biking or walking to get where they need to go. And next slide. So, so that, speaking of where people wanted to go, we had an interactive map as part of this where uh, it was a really cool tool. Folks could go on and uh, with different uh, icons, select the places that they would love to be able to access the trail, the places where they wanted certain amenities, um, and the destinations that they would like to reach um, by using the trail. Um, so the, this is just a screen grab from, from one of the sections from the, uh, Eastern end of the, of the trail in Hillsboro there, where you can see a lot of green dots and, and red triangles. It's right around downtown Hillsboro, you know, the max station there. Um, so from, from that interactive map, we saw popular access points that people selected, um, 
throughout the corridor, really at major uh, major north-south crossings, Douglas Street, Oak Street, U Street, 10th, 9th, 340, 341st, and, and the Mac Station. Um, a lot of a lot of people is probably no surprise in terms of the places people wanted to go. Pacific University, Forest Grove campus, um, the the grocery stores that are along that are nearby the trail, the Cornelius Library, um, and then the uh, the Tualatin Valley Scenic uh, Bikeway um, as a as a connection there. Next slide. So, uh, in terms of asking or, or learning what folks wanted to see on the trail um, <clears throat> to make their experience better and ideal um we had a bunch of options that they could select and they had to select their top three um and but we also had options that they could they could select other and and give their own ideas um but you see this breakdown here obviously you know folks wanted to see restrooms and seating um lighting again for the safety piece uh wanted to see want it to be a beautiful place with with plenty of of natural features um a lot about dogway stations, separation of users, so so that bikes and and uh, those who are walking wouldn't necessarily conflict. Um, and then wayfinding signage and educational signage, so like cultural information or historic information, that sort of thing. Um, but then we got some interesting ideas from folks. Um, you know, having play structures, um, having you know features for bike repair or um or uh uh locking etc a horse trail um those those sorts of things that um that you know you throw out there and and people are interested in seeing you know what the world of possibilities is for something like this and i then, think that's it so yeah any more questions for jake i i have one hi jake um you know, when I took the, the walk on Friday, uh, everybody was kidding me because I kept saying no parks, no parks, because eventually if there is a park there, it would be difficult to turn that into a light rail alignment. And so when people are interested in play amenities, I said even last Friday, you know, like you don't want to have a swing set because people will say it's a park. And I, I, I just want to put that out there. You've got to be careful. Yeah, we're aware of that. I think I I think there's a way um, because it is designated in the high capacity transit plan and the regional transportation plan. I think that that establishes that use, um, and that we may be able to have some other inter interim uses. But it's definitely something we need to do our homework about. Hey, we, you and I have talked about that. Um, I'm a lot more cautious, so I'll just leave it there. <laughs> yes. Any other questions for Jake? Well, just a comment. Um, uh, you know, after uh, when we were on the trail, we encountered, I don't know, three or four or five people. One is, was pretty adamant. So, uh, Mayor Deland will, will have to give us a report on that, at, at how that conversation went, because basically we all wandered off on him after about 10 minutes. Um, but this is really good information and it's, and it's very, very positive. So, um, so yeah, I'm encouraged about this. Uh, there is, um, as we saw on the walk, there, there's still a considerable amount of work to be done to build this thing, but We'll get into that a little bit later, but um, really, Jake, this was uh, this was great information, and I'm I'm really impressed with the number of responders we had on that. So, uh, and the information we got from that, um, and I'm sure we're going to get plenty of feedback as we continue down through this process, and certainly when we start uh, when the railroad starts pulling up the rails and those kinds of things, we'll probably get a lot more attention. So. Anyway, good information. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I just want to say one thing too. I have spent a lot of time last summer and in these last couple of um, 
farmers markets out in the community talking to people and uh, what I hear from people mirrors what we see here. The overwhelming majority of the people are very excited about this project. When we have the open houses at Cornelius Library or something like that, we get a little bit more of the caution and concern because you get the neighbors or the people who um, are, are a little bit more worried about it. But yeah, definitely similar to what I've been hearing in the community. Um, uh, Carlos here. Um, yeah. If we could just go, but yeah, hey, hey, everyone. Um, obviously, I just I do want to echo real quick how wonderful it is to have such strong community support. Um, and I, I, I mean, I think if if you've spent time in that at the part of the region, like you'll know that it's people are really, really desperate for uh, recreation and outdoor spaces like this. And so I think it's going to be really, really a, a huge hit. You know, on the on the piece of parks, you know, I I do want to, you know, add a a badge or like a you know, a notch or whatever whatever the right saying is of like support for some aspect of that because, you know, there is um, a, a very large Latino community on the west side, um, especially in the kind of in in the area of this corridor and you know, families tend to be, households tend to be larger and are, you know, looking for, for ways to, you know, be outside with the entire family. And so even if it's not necessarily on this easement, on this project, um, I think it's important for our, for this kind of, as it develops for wayfinding to point like, oh, hey, I, I know from, from leaving here that there are parks, you know, one block, one block to the left, one block to the right, um, that will be very close to this that we can like point to, you know, people going and taking breaks and things like that. So I do, I do want to emphasize how important that is. And I'll, and I'll reinforce that, uh, one thing in the focus groups that we conducted, uh, particularly amongst the Latino focus groups, we heard about gathering spaces and, sp and spaces for family, um, to, to eat or, or, you know, whatever. So, yeah, that that seems consistent. So, I, I think there's a, a desire for that, but also want to recognize, you know, there's a lot of issues. I was going to jump in because I think about the wayfinding and those other adjacent uses. Right, Hortichoke Park literally backs right up to this in Cornelius, and they talked about the dog facilities. While our dog park is like a block away, so I think you know an off-leash dog park. I don't. I don't see the linear trails in off-leash dog park this corridor, but the ability to get to one, or that's part of the thing, right? Is being able to go to that off-leash park there. I see, I see, I see those as collaborative things. And to, um, if there's an appropriate spot, I can share some of the concerns that were shared with me by some of the citizens, the good citizens along the way that decide to interact with this. Yeah, I think um, in the in the next we're gonna have a, a minute to talk about the um, the walk. If there aren't any more questions for Jake or comments, moving right along, um, I just wanted to give a quick right away update on the the process. So. Um, on April 7th, Washington County and TriMet completed a near-term memorandum of understanding for planning, design, and construction efforts that just says that we're going to work together and cooperate and coordinate on um, acquisition of right-of-way and this project. Um, so that was good. And then the other thing that's happened on um, I think we, we'd probably already reported that the abandonment was complete on February 20. Fifth and PNWR submitted the termination of easement ODOT or the Oregon Department of Administrative Services surplus the right away on April 20th. There was a 30 day waiting period and only TriMet and Washington County expressed interest in the right of way. So that's good. Um, there was also an adjacent parcel that ODOT wanted to surplus with it because they didn't want kind of a, um, uh, an, an extra parcel hanging out there. 
Um, we were going to be interested in it, but Forest Grove has um, already done some work on a regional water quality facility for that parcel. So I believe they're pursuing that. Um, so our understanding through our conversations with ODOT is that PNWR does intend to salvage the at least some of the rail and equipment. We're not sure if it's all or some or what. They own it, so they're entitled to do that. ODOT has requested that they do that within the year, I believe the calendar year. I don't think they have any um, ability to enforce that, but I think that's PNWR's intention. They're going out for RFP to, to the do that. Sorry. Uh, so that that may take some time um, and and we um, because they are still sort of in the corridor when we out go out to do field work or like the walk we do need to coordinate with them in case they're um, out there doing work removing their equipment and then um, just wanted to point out that at least Forest Grove, I suspect Cornelius got this too. I hadn't heard from them, but the county also received notice to remove advanced warning signage. Um, uh, and we got that from ODOT, I believe. I have a copy of the letter. Um, and that we have two years to do that. What's interesting about that is, um, you know, there haven't been trains there since 2015, but people still have to, all the signage is there because the, the railroad hadn't abandoned it yet, so people have to stop, wait for no train to go by, and then go. Um, and so now all the jurisdictions are, you know, being told to close the crossings. Um, just about the time that we'll be needing to put up advance warning signage for the trail. So um, hopefully, I don't know, we'll have to talk about what makes sense there, if it makes sense to kind of wait and remove that signage because you want to keep people in the habit of stopping. I don't, I don't know. I guess that'll be up to the jurisdictions, but um, that's something that's that's happening. Um, and then also, I understand from TriMet that they are in the process of hiring an appraiser. ODOT had a list of approved appraisers, and TriMet picked one and is uh, working on um, a scope with them. So they are in that process, and I'm happy to uh, entertain any questions. I may or may not have answers. Well, Julie, let me jump in just a little bit. I, you know, we started right there at. Um, I can't remember the intersection we started at, but that's that's one of those intersections that has a stop sign mm -hmm. across the railway. Um, and it's been there for a very long time, even though everybody knows there's no train coming. Um, I, I would think that we should keep the stop signs up there so we uh, don't have to reacclimate drivers that, oops, wait a minute, we got a trail here, now we got to stop again. So if we could mm -hmm. just, leave that stop sign there and and i don't i don't know what you mean by notice to remove advanced warning signage what i well what's because the warning signage? that's like if it there's signage that says like railroad ahead or um oh. stop ahead so there's there's signs that are required as part of the railroad crossing that the I guess the, I, it's not really 100% clear to me, but I, I think the city is responsible for installing and maintaining those signs or something, or maybe the railroad had to install them, but the city has to remove them. So because the it's no longer a railroad crossing, the order came from, I believe, ODOT to, but they're basically closing the crossings and um, remove that signage and there was a time frame on it and it was two years and I don't know if it's from when the letter got sent or from when the um, termination of the easement was effective or something like that so basically a little less than two years from now so uh, mayor I, I don't know if you're uh, you're on board here um, would that be something that if we wanted to keep those stop signs and maybe put up a new sign in advance of that that says future Council Creek trails stop ahead or something. Um, would that be something that the city council would have to approve to supplement this or because I guess what what I'm thinking is, is that we shouldn't be removing those stop signs and making that a through fare and then all of a sudden a couple of years from now we put them back up again. 
So I, I'd, I'd appreciate your thoughts on that. Well, I, I just one, one comment before that, the signs we'll put up for the trail will be different. There'll be different type of warning and signage. So it's not going to be the same signage. I understand your point if it's to keep people in the habit, but it will be a different, that's going to be part of our intersection crossing project that isn't going to start probably until 2025. So there may be a gap between when we're required to remove that signing and when we'll be installing um, intersection crossings. I just want to say that. Well, yeah, and I guess what I was saying is even if there is a gap, whether it's be six months or two years, um, people are, you know, we're all creatures of habit. We pull up to that. I come into Cornelius all the time on that street. I know there's a stop sign there. So let's keep that habit in place so that when we have a trail there, um, we don't have to retrain the driver. So anyway, that's just my thoughts on this. We can cross that bridge later. Jerry? Yes, so I'll comment. Um, it sounds like an unfunded mandate from the state and it's probably going to take us probably six or seven years to forecast funding to get those signs down. So I'm not sure there's going to be a gap. <laughs> I hear you. I don't think it's a state deal, though. I think it sounds to me like it's a railroad thing. But um, and, and we will play just as well with them as they've played with us. <laughs> okay, enough said on that. We'll move on, Jeff. So this public meeting doesn't. Uh, start giving off some hints. Um, I, I see Juan Carlos has his hand up. Yeah, um, I'm wondering what does it mean to to surplus something? I, I, I've never heard that term before. Oh, that, walk me through it? Yeah, so um, when ODOT, so basically um, when the railroad band terminated their easement, the right of way was um, owned by ODOT Rail and they no longer have a purpose for it. Okay. So that's the process they go through to sell it. They call it surplusing the property. Oh. And there's a there's a list of who it goes to first. Like they can give it to other state agencies and then they can um, transfer it to other government entities there's one that's like for uh, affordable housing i think is in there there's there's a list there's an order of um who gets priority to acquire the property and other um government agencies which you know we are yeah. are are high on the list so they they basically put it in a um if you go on odot's website or the Department of Administrative Services website. They have a bunch of kinds of properties for sale, just excess property. They call it surplusing. Okay, great. Thank you. And and the I guess what I'm trying to figure out is um are they just transferring it for kind of like air quotes free? Or um, you know, I know that that was one of the items that we were hoping to be able to negotiate since the project is so far along. And, yeah. and so anyway, I mean, if they slap a, a really high fee on that or not, that would, you know, obviously not be ideal. So that, that, that was the point of my question since I, since I don't think the the railroad sold it to back to the state, right. They just left it without any kind of transaction value. Yes, there was, they owed back taxes and the state kind of took it in trade for that. Um, okay. I, I believe the state is required to sell it at fair market value. And so that's why TriMet is required to hire an appraiser to determine what the fair market value is. So the, the appraiser will um, use the tools that they use to identify what the fair market value of an abandoned railroad corridor is. I understand that it has, you know, one, it has limited value. You can't really build anything on it, but it also has, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how they determine the value, but <laughs> I understand that it is also, there are encumbrances associated with that. For example, there's a power line easement and that kind of goes against the value because then that's part of the corridor that you can't really use or that 
that causes an encumbrance to the corridor. So there's these kind of like pluses and minuses that the appraiser will go through and then there'll probably be some kind of a negotiation between TriMed and ODOT to establish what that fair market value and the cost would be. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for walking me through that. I hadn't dealt with something like this yet. Yes. Um, and others may know more. So if somebody knows more, I'm learning as well, but um, that's how I understand it. Well, yeah, and I like to just, I, I need to say that um, right now I'm on an iPad, so I see four squares, so I don't see any hands raised. So Julie, if you could take care of that one, Carlos, I'm sorry I, I'm sorry I made you wait so long on that. I, I, I would like to hear a little bit from Tom uh, from TriMet side of things. Um, what has been your experience on that? What are you anticipating on this? Um, Gary, what exactly do you mean? Well, on the on the appraisal of this right away, I mean, as we walk down it, <laughs> um, and as we go the other direction, the next uh, for the three miles from Cornelius to Forest Grove, we're going to see more encumbrances on this thing. It's going to be interesting to see what this appraiser comes up and what's the evaluation they do. I mean, what are you guys thinking? Well, I'll tell you what. Um, we really, it's a crapshoot. You never know what it's going to come out at. But I do, you know, I, I mentioned that when the county, Multnomah County and TriMed and a group of other agencies bought an alignment from downtown Portland to, uh, to Lake Oswego, they bought it for one and a half million dollars. And, and the appraisal done about 10 years ago shows that it's worth a hundred million dollars today. So I have no doubt that this is a wise investment. I really do, because you will never assemble an alignment like that again. So yep. uh, I, guess, agree. I don't know how it's going to come out, but I bet it's going to be a solid, uh, solid investment. Well, yeah, I don't think there's any question about that. I just wonder, I'm hoping that they, uh, they give us a bargain on this deal. So well, Chris anyway. Ford has his Chris hand Ford. up, so maybe he can answer that you. question. Please, Chris, please. Hi, hi. I'm here on, to share Chris. the. I'm going to hear to share wisdom right off of an email sent by somebody who knows what they, they're doing. So, you know, ODOT's a, a big enterprise um, and uh, ODOT Rail is really the specialist in this. So uh, when Councilor Gonzalez asked these questions, I'm like, wait, I think I got an email on at one point. Sorry, it took a moment. Julie's answer was really accurate. Um, and it's it's not a common process, but there is a process. And so kind of everything that's happened to date has been, I will say, by the book, assuming that's the way it happens. And so it is definitely helpful when uh, only one entity says that they want a um, wants the property, which is the, the case here. Um, so the, the additional information is um, we tell the interested party to pay for professional appraisal. That's what happens. Once we receive the appraisal, ODOT has staff who review such documents. It's not going to be me, um, but they're experts in that. And if ODOT approves the appraisal, then ODOT tells the interested party to make us an offer and negotiations may ensue. So that's the process. What exactly happens at the end of that process is, well, a negotiation. Um, I do have an additional note. The, the, Besides reasons like, say, back taxes, uh, the reasons why I do think that there's a state requirement that whenever we're offloading property, we have to get fair market value, noting that that can be kind of a strange thing, given some of the strange properties that we own. Um, so these uh, those fees pay for staff time, the occasional consultation with the Department of Justice, and these funds get used to pay for kind of random issues that show up. Back taxes is an example. There's another example right here, paying a contractor to cut up and dispose of a barge abandoned uh, in a line corridor. Um, and so things come up. So those are possibly things that would affect negotiation, but hopefully that just gives a little bit more information. I think the answer is we've had a process up to date and now we will see. Hope that's helpful. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, we, we, uh, we're we supposed to be talking a little bit right now about uh, just the tour debrief, the walk debrief. We do have uh, Adrian scheduled for a 540, which was six minutes ago. Uh, so Julie, you need to keep me on task here. Maybe we I can. I realized. Do, maybe we can do the wrap up 
of the walking tour and talk about that right at the end and bring on Adrian so we're not uh, deterring him from uh, his presentation. Is that okay? Yeah, let's do that. Then then we'll just uh, take the time we want to at the end. I think that's a good idea. Yeah, great. Thanks, Julie. Uh, well, um, we've been working on uh, developing some cross sections to, for the corridor, and you know, you you have seen in the past some cross sections that were, you know, uh, more uh, cross sections that were not developed based on our current terrain in this corridor. So they were more, you know, typical sections that you would see for trails. Um, so we've spent some time developing some cross sections using actual terrain. So using our, our survey data to, to develop cross sections that are more realistic from what the terrain would be. Um, we have five different ones that we think are representative of the corridor to give you a better sense of what is out there. And I, you know, it's good timing. You were all out there recently. So you're going to maybe recognize some of the terrain in, in this, in these cross sections. Um, with that, you know, this is a project that was funded uh, for a 12 foot wide trail. Um, but as you saw in some of the survey, and as we heard from some of the public meetings we've had and some of the um, focus groups, uh, people are interested in a wider trail, particularly in areas where they anticipate high usage and uh, mixed use. So a lot of biking and, and pedestrians and families. Um, so, so there's concern about safety, uh, particularly in light of you know, a lot of uh, these new e-bikes that travel at higher speeds. Um, and commingling with with you know families that maybe walk in the corridor with strollers and and kids on small bikes. So um, and looking at that and using some of the data that that we uh, saw from the survey, um, and essentially the corridor is is a 12 foot trail. There is a, se a segment in the Cornelius area where it's higher density, and a lot of the uh, the information that we saw of places people want to go to is, are located within this part of the corridor, where a 16 foot trail, you know, may be something that we might want to consider. Um, so this is just kind of the overall map um, and we'll go through each of the five different cross sections uh, here just to discuss them. So um, next uh, slide. So the first one, you know, it's a relatively flat area. Um, you know, there, there may be a, a existing ditch, but it's 12 foot trail, relatively flat opportunity for some landscaping uh, to, you know, beautify the area. Uh, pretty uh, easy to construct based on the current terrain. Um, the 12 foot trail, it's, it's sufficient for, you know, most trails that are 12 feet wide, it's sufficient for multi-use. So uh, it's, 12 feet is pretty wide. Um, and, you know, this is where, parts of the uh, trail where we saw use, but not necessarily the same high density. Um, and just a quick note, some of the markings you will see, they're not gonna be painted throughout the trail. They're just more information for that so people understand kind of how the use will be. So uh, the next the next uh, section, section B, uh, you could see there's a little bit more difference in the terrain. We've got the railroad uh, alignment that's up a little bit higher than the other terrain within the right of way. Um, in this in this particular case, um, we have the, uh, the Council Creek that goes alongside of the trail. It goes underneath through a culvert, and Council Creek heads to the north. So then this one, obviously a little more limited in what you can do from a landscaping standpoint. But again, a 12 foot asphalt trail um, with uh, some grading that need, can be done uh, to uh, be able to provide some additional landscaping areas. This next part of the trail, this is more common throughout the trail, uh, relatively flat, a little bit of grading, opportunity for some uh, landscaping. Uh, you know, we talked about amenities and uh, possibility of adding, you know, people want some benches, they want some lighting, they want uh, places to, to gather and things like that. Uh, where you get to some of these flat areas, there's more opportunity to do some of that work, um, or at least uh, opportunities to put some signage um, some, you know, particularly in areas where we have natural resources, information on natural resources. So again, 12 foot trail, uh, this is pretty typical through the forest grove region. It's going to be a relatively flatter area with, uh, not as much, uh, grading work that needs to happen. As we go further to the east, uh, this is one of the sections that was discussed, um, as being a 16 foot wide trail. Particularly, this is an area that's high density with a lot of connection points that were that were part of the survey. Uh, so, 16 foot trail, uh, you know, this area where you could separate uses, put pedestrians on the one side of the trail, put uh, bikes on the other, 
really allow for multi-use uh, mixing of of uh, different uh, modes um, and you know the precip the the safe safety of it being separated. And again, the markings are, are optional, uh, but it does give that wider wider trail. Uh, it's also a flatter area. Um, there's not a lot of grading through here, so opportunity there again uh, for some landscaping and some amenities to be included. Uh, this is a pretty long stretch through mostly Cornelius um, as we start approaching um, Dairy Creek uh, on the east. So as we start approaching the creek, as you, you would imagine, we start to gain elevation as we're trying to cross over the creek. And so you see that the, uh, the, the section, we're still able to put a 12 foot trail, uh, but there's really not a lot of opportunity here for, um, you know, for a lot of amenities because it is limited to the, based on the terrain that we have out there. So I mean, when you guys were walking out there, I'm sure you felt like that, you know, you were able to see that as we approach the creek, the, the, the trail itself, uh, would be gaining elevation um, to be able to provide a structure to get up and over the creek. So those are the typical cross sections that we've come up with. And, and as I mentioned, you know, those are based on a lot of the information that we asked. One thing that I, that I do want to add, we, we took a quick look at, you know, what does it mean from a cost standpoint to go from a 12 foot trail to a 16 foot trail? Uh, because obviously this project was, was planned and budgeted for a 12 foot trail throughout the corridor. Um, so it's based on just some, some of our other projects and some calculations, uh, we estimated that the widening from a 12 foot to a 16 foot trail comes at a cost of about 150,000 per mile. Um, so that is, you know, just specifically talking about asphalt base rock to make the trail 12 feet to 16 feet. That doesn't account for in situations like you're seeing here, where if we were to widen to 16 feet in this particular corridor, um, there would be need to be retaining structures. Um, in other areas where we have existing culverts, if we were to widen to 16 feet, we'd have to extend culverts. So there's a lot of other costs that would be factored in, but if we're just speaking from a standpoint of the cost of making a 12 foot trail to a 16 foot asphalt trail, I uh, just wanted to give a sense of just in material and construction, you're looking at about 150,000 per, per mile. Plus, if that makes you hit any other environmental concerns or anything like that, then that could Correct. affect that as well. Yeah. So at this point, I'll take any questions on, on some of the cross sections or if there are other questions about um, the trail widths. Well, is it possible, Adrian, to, uh, to go from because there was some some parts of the trail that we walked there that a 16 foot trail would be easy. Okay. And then of course, as you get closer to Dairy Creek, as you pointed out, it needs to go back down to 12 feet. Um, so is it is it possible for us to kind of go from 16 to 12 back yeah. and forth a little yeah, bit? Yeah, so on that? so you can transition. And you know, that that is an option to say, hey, in particular areas where we have connections to uh, other to parks or to, you know, there was mentioned there's parks and other access points that, that people were interested in. At those locations, you know, we could widen the trail to 16 feet to provide for the mix of people coming on, going off the different directions, and then take it back down to 12 feet once you get beyond that area. Um, we also have one particular area, we have a 10 foot trail, and that is on the structure. Obviously, the, the wider the structure, the more expensive it is. And, um, you know, so right now, the, the, the plan is for the structure itself to to be 12, 12 feet wide from rail to rail, but with the, you know, 10 feet of actual trail with one foot shoulders. Okay. Uh, Juan Carlos has his hand up. Yeah, thank you. So, um, looks good. I mean, I think it, it makes sense. Um, you know, I, I use my experience on other, other trails throughout the region to kind of visualize it. And so it checks out. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit, we were talking about the signage earlier and, and, and the driver behavior. Um, and it made me think about at those major intersections where we do have either, um, you know, connect like uh, important, important throughways. Do we envision to have a kind of a, a, a standard of just stop signs where will they be signalized? Do we know that yet? And if I'm jumping way too far ahead in the process, let me know. It's just, there's so many different ways for, you know, high traffic trails like this to manage traffic, as you know, and I'm, and I'm wondering about that, especially as I think about 
how narrow or wide these corridors are, right? So anyway, I hope that's an okay question to ask right now. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, timely question, we have been looking at all of the, all of the intersections uh, throughout the corridor. Um, and, you know, Julie hasn't seen it yet, but we just kind of finalized a draft of that report with, uh, with recommendations for each of those crossings. So I should have, you know, the, the county should be see, see those later this week uh, to get a sense of what those recommendations are. And those are based on existing traffic uh, volumes and other factors that are considered. So obviously, Highway 47 is one that is a major thoroughfare through there and the, the uh, recommendations and the uh, crossing that's going to need to happen there is going to be a lot a more, uh, I guess it would be a, a bigger uh, improvement than per se a street where it's, you know, it's a stop sign and there's limited volume of cars that are basically accessing the property on the other side. So definitely that is all factored in and we are considering the type of signage uh, not just for vehicles, but also for for the bikes and pedestrians that are using the trail. So alerting both both sides about the the major crossing and you know, recommending you know, rapid flashing beacons or hawk signals at intersections that are considered high volume and potential for uh, uh, conflict. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Adrian. Uh, another thing that I I think it's important for us to consider as we move forward. I mean the you know, that mark, that cost of 150K per mile or being more or less, you know, I think I'm, I'm also thinking about um, potential speed limits on the corridor. I mean, we have e-bikes, scooters, you know, electric skateboards, and those, go, those can go pretty fast as well. I mean, maybe it's not, a, a, it won't be an issue, but, you know, I, I tend to think that, I mean, we're, we're viewing this not only as a recreational, but could you know, in the future, see it as a commuting corridor as well. So I'm also thinking about how people would behave on it um, as an alternative to getting on TV highway to do those things, right? So just a, just another thing to think about, obviously costs we need to be very, very, very careful about, but adding a, another variable on there. Yeah, and, and to your point, you know, uh, at our at, at the attack meeting that we had, there was a good discussion about this and uh, uh, Metro brought, brought some good points to the table that, you know, the width of the trail um, really comes into consideration when there is a mix of use, not necessarily speeds. So speeds, you know, if you're out, you know, on the uh, Banks Vernonia and, and it's mostly bikes, you know, the speed is not really the issue if you have mostly bikes on there. Where it becomes a problem is where you have people that are walking, people that are biking, and that's when, you know, you start mixing uses and different speeds and that's when it becomes more of a, more of a problem. Um, and as you saw in the survey, 75% of the respondents were looking to be walking. So a lot of walking within the corridor. And I think about 65% were gonna be using bikes. So, so that's the areas where we start looking at, there's a, a good mixed use there. And those are areas we wanna consider uh, for a wider trail. And in areas where we saw a lot of biking, then we say, hey, that's not necessarily gonna be an issue. You know, Of course, there'll be people that are walking or jogging, uh, but those will not be a high incidence. So um, that's kind of the data that we're using. Any okay, any, yeah, anybody else? That's a great presentation. There is a lot of work. Um, even in just the three mile section that we saw, Juan Carlos, there's a number of, <clears throat> well, I won't say a number, there's three or four actual driveways that are streets that have crossed over the railroad tracks. And it looks like they, they kind of came out there and dumped a bunch of gravel over it. So they just drive over the top of the rails. I mean, it, I'm sure it's a legit driveway, but it's all those kinds of variables that we're going to be looking at when we talk about crossings and protecting people who are on the trail and things like that. So, right, a lot of interesting stuff out there. So, we ready to move on? Yeah. So, I was going to give a little background. We're, we're starting to look, and I know I, we brought this up at our last meeting that we you know the, the structure is going to be a big, a big key decision uh, whether we use existing structure whether we put a new structure in the same alignment or whether we shift uh, the structure on a different part of the, the, the corridor, um, you know, keeping in mind what may happen in the future. So uh, right now we're at the process where we're, we're having the hydraulic analysis being done at, you know, as we speak. Um, and that's gonna give you information for our bridge designers to think about what type of structure they're gonna be looking at, 
Um, right now, the assumption is that it'll be three spans, the main span over Dairy Creek, and then the two spans approaching it on either side. Um, the thought is, you know, there's a couple of different options um, really to think about whether it's something that can be salvaged and reused in the future. So if we, are, if we were to keep it on the center alignment and replace the existing structure, or you know, even if we move it off to a north or south, um, do we want a structure that in the future can be moved um, and you know, build new foundations and move it to a different part of the corridor? Um, obviously that, that may impact cost, or do we want a structure that, hey, when this high capacity transit happens in the future, they, they will build a structure that accommodates both. Um, so we, do we wanna uh, spend the, uh, the cost now that would give us a structure that's, that's reusable in the future? Um, so right now we're looking at starting to look at the types of different structures that are available for the, you know, that would be within the budget. Right now the concrete, the concrete structure, you're looking at about two to $300 per square foot and steel structures at about 250 to $400 per square foot. So uh, more, just some basic information. There'll be more to come as we uh, dive deeper into um, the structure and able to provide more information for, for the group. Sorry, any, <laughs> any questions on that? Well, yeah, I guess I just, I was thinking about this as I was walking over the bridge. I mean, obviously it felt pretty solid to me. Um, so I was just wondering why we couldn't just build over the top of it, but it sounds to me like uh, we have to look at the, the foundational structure of this thing to determine all of those things, because when we start putting the trail over the top of it, we're adding some additional weight uh, so anyway, I, I don't know all those intricacies, um, so I'll wait to hear from, uh, I guess, the report on recommendations. Yeah, and the and the uh, the existing structure, yeah, it, it, it obviously there was there was railroads on it. Um, it's more about the long longevity of that structure. So you know there there is decay and there's a lot of maintenance that needs to happen. Um, and really, what is what would be the lifespan of reusing that facility and you know what is it what is the expectation uh, of the lifespan of that so you know is it good for 20 years and are they you know is it good to have it for 20 and they have to replace it or is it better to build something now that'll last 50 to 70 years so it's really going to be trade-offs that we'll have to consider and, and cost you know obviously it's it needs to be retrofitted um, to be brought up to current um, seismic um, standards and so what does that mean from a standpoint of what improvements need to be made and what sort of environmental impact will there be because it is an old structure okay so any other questions out there all right so uh the next part of the discussion is really revolving around maintenance and management of the trail um, so some of the, you know, the primary reason to maintain the trail is obviously for safety to ensure that it's continuously safe for the users. Um, it obviously prolongs the life of the trail. Uh, it promotes a positive relationship with adjacent landowners, uh, reduces like legal liability when an accident does occur on the trail, and really it helps avoid some of those costly repairs that if uh, the trail is not maintained on a regular basis, um, you know, will, will result in having to make major repairs to it. And, and there's also the sense of stewardship and pride in the community. So those are a lot of the main reasons why, you know, the management plan is really important. Um, and the main thing about it is that, uh, you know, the safety of users. So that is the, the primary concern to make sure that the trail remains uh, safe for all of the users. So I guess from my standpoint, we've had this conversation a little bit, kind of casually, but who's, who's gonna be responsible for maintaining the trail? And is it the three cities who have ownership of that? I'd probably three cities in the county, because I think a portion of it actually goes through uh, unincorporated Washington County or rural Washington County. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a conversation we're going to have to have. I don't know when or how we go about having that conversation, but certainly it's going to be important and how that relationship works with TriMet. So, Julie, if you can kind of set me on a, on a path here. Yep, we've got a couple <laughs> slides, so hold, 
hold on for a couple <laughs> minutes and then we'll get into that conversation a little bit. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to get ahead here. Nope. No, that's, that's, <laughs> no, that's, that's no you're worries. leading you're... right into the, yep. the uh, next slide. So it's like you you uh you read our minds. So yeah, so the big question is who's going to manage the trail? Um, you know, how are you going to get the funding to, to do the management? As we all know, uh, funding is is everyone's uh, budgets are tight, and you know, funding um, maintenance is going to be an issue. Um, and then how do we ensure that the the trail is used throughout the year? So this is a trail that's a regional trail open uh you know 24 hours a day 365 days a year so how do we in ensure the safety of of the trail users so just to give a, a, a rough approximation in the sense of what we're looking at uh based on you know a study of a lot of different trails throughout the country we've determined that it's approximately 15 to twenty thousand dollars a year per mile of trail. So for a six mile trail, you're looking at about 90 to $120,000 a year in annual maintenance. Um, the major uh, maintenance items are, you know, mowing, vegetation of management, you know, debris and trash removal. Uh, if there are uh, restrooms, uh, restroom maintenance, parking areas, vandalism, dumping signs, uh, the trail itself, you know, repairing uh, any asphalt damage, whether it's from uh, just general use or you know any event that may happen but just on a regular standard basis you're looking at fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year per mile um, obviously if there are trailheads and, and other you know, lighting and other amenities um, you know those would be additional costs that would be factored in uh, but you know for this project we're gonna assume that it'll be about a hundred thousand dollars a year in May so where does that funding come from and, and who's going to be responsible for it so, So some examples of uh, management plans, uh, you know, are they've been management plans that are partnerships between different agencies. Uh, those are pretty common. Uh, so some examples of partnerships for this project could be, you know, TriMet as the owner of the right of way could take the lead. Uh, we could also do uh, one of the cities or the agencies takes the lead with support from the other agencies. Um, other uh, options are each city and county takes responsibility for the segment of trail within their within their jurisdiction. Um, there's also the opportunity to contract with private services that are funded by the agencies and also working with Land Conservancy and other non-governmental organizations also funded by agencies. Um, and just I'll give a couple examples of, of some of the uh, agreements that are out there now and some of the projects that we've worked on. So project in California, Coachella Valley, CV Link Trail, 55 miles of trail, obviously crosses several jurisdictions. Uh, the Coachella Valley Association of Governments is, at the moment has agreed to take on uh, the responsibility of the maintenance plan for those, uh, for the 55 mile trail. Uh, they are looking at several different ways of managing that where part of it is, you know, selling uh, adopt a mile to businesses and other uh, entities. Um, they're also gonna have to have areas where they contract out the work to have, uh, you know, a contract private services to do some of the work. So they're still in, in, in figuring out what exactly that, that would mean, but it will be a combination of private businesses with the uh, hired services to manage the trail. So that's one example. Um, in Columbus, Ohio, uh, there's a trail there where there's parks and, and the uh, parks and rec department for the city, as well as the, uh, the, uh, Parks District um, have agreed that Parks District would take on the responsibility for their trails, uh, but with the assistance and funding from, from the uh, Parks and Rec Department. So they had one entity that's gonna do all of the maintenance with support from the other entity, uh, but that, that's how they agreed to manage their trail. So there's a lot of different uh, opportunities here. Uh, obviously we have a lot of agencies involved um, and it's something that you know, as we start getting towards you know, design and construction, things that we really need to consider and start talking about. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, Adrian just kind of hit the nail on the head. You know, we, we've got these different periods that we have to be thinking about. We've got pre-construction, what happens now? Like already we're noticing that the railroad's out and 
um, you know, ODOT's getting calls and they don't really know what to do because they're not used to maintaining the corridor. So who's going to be responsible when things come up? Um, and then there'll be a transition point. If TriMed takes over the corridor, then they're the owner. But um, we just have all these things that we need to be figuring out, um, you know, maintenance, pre-construction, during construction, also safety, security, uh, liability. Um, we talked in the TAC about having no trespassing signs. Apparently there's some out there. I, I got this picture from the, um, the tour um, and we talked about maybe having no trespassing signs with a phone number or someone to contact or, you know, if there's some issue, um, if that would be TriMet or someone else. Um, and then we'll also be need to think about long-term IGAs, post-construction maintenance and security. So all that leads to, would this group like to direct staff to form a subcommittee for maintenance and operations? Because this seems like kind of a big thing that we need to be figuring out and who should be, if we do, who should participate, who should lead it, um, and what would be the purpose? And we've got some ideas here, but kind of wanted to hear your thoughts. So I have a question. Metro has a, a trail program. Um, have you considered having them be the manager of the trail? Metro has pretty clearly indicated that they don't want to be the manager of the trail. Julie, I can chime in on that. Um, so Tom, we we do have we our grant program is on the bond side, so it's capital. Uh, I mean, we did just renew our levy. Um, um and uh, i'm imagining that staff feel like that's already quite constrained with you know spreading the peanut butter throughout so many of our sites and um i know with uh Chihalem ridge staffing it because it's so far from all of our other assets in the region it's it's just complicated right because everyone's everyone is uh headquartered so far east um so i i, I mean I, I definitely am feeling right now like it's something that i would love to talk with John Blasher, our director about to, I mean, at the minimum, make a contribution, even if it's, you know, a, a, a small amount per year to whatever govern, governing entity it is, because, I mean, that it's important to me, so I would hope it's important to Metro. Well, it seemed to me, Ju Julie, that... Um, that whoever should participate in this subcommittee is going to have to have some expertise, obviously, in all of this. Um, you put somebody like me on there, it's, you're going to hear, hear, hear some really wingnut ideas that aren't feasible, but they sound good to me. Uh, so when we're talking about planning, engineering staff, uh, parks departments, those kinds of things, I mean, that makes sense to me. Um, I don't know how we'd go about pulling that together, but I certainly think it has to be a group of people that have some expertise in in trails. Yeah, one thing, uh, when Carlos's comment reminded me of in doing a little bit of research, one of the things that comes up is um, mobilization and access to equipment and that kind of thing. And so from that perspective, the, the cities that have parks departments might make some sense here because they already have the equipment kind of in the right place so that's just throwing that out there that's one thing to consider well before i lose cell coverage i'm going to jump in um i think working with the cities and the county jointly to look at how we manage and maintain it is probably the the right place to start and I would volunteer my city manager as an active member to represent our city on that. So I think maybe a, a, a blending of the policy and the professionals would probably be a good idea of a subcommittee. So I would put, I would volunteer my city manager and myself to work on that, uh, maintenance upkeep and how we'd fund and do that. Um, because one of the things I see is um, the partnerships that we've already fostered between the city of Forest Grove for services and and all kinds of different fire service and, and sports. We have a really good track record of working with the city of Forest Grove on stuff. 
Um, so I could see us doing that. The, the road maintenance and repairs and stuff that we do between us and the county, I think there's already been a hit a track record of good success there. To how we manage this. And I'd be want to say a big one in response to the safety concerns of our both interested and disinterested public on this uh, corridor is um, with TriMet in the right of way, how do we get in there to patrol and enforce um, the safety of that area? Well, I would, I would just guess, I, I think uh, that's where IGAs come in. We're gonna have to have those anyway to kind of basically build the partnership between TriMet and county and, and the three cities. So yeah, we could, we could let the attorneys work on the IJs about how we would go about facilitating that. But um, yeah, Julie, I guess, do you have any more thoughts Jerry, before on the IJ from this? Yep. I, I would jump in, Jerry, and say before an IG, there's discussion, right? The, lead, the lawyers will work out what our intent is right. and get there. But I think we really need to sit down with partners, talk about where we want to be and what we think and how we fund it in the long term. And then from that, we could develop the IGA. So the, I think the first one's a discussion. Yeah, a good idea, Jeff. I, I completely agree. So what are next steps, Julie? Well, I think um, <laughs> just trying to understand how this is going to work. I think it's, you know, TriMet is an important partner uh, and obviously the cities and the county. And I appreciate the mayor's suggestion that it be um, the city manager from his city. Is that who it should be from the other cities? Is this something that I should be convening or the county? Um, I'm happy to do that. I just want to make sure that we have the right people there. I think what we probably should do is have some sort of subcommittee and I see Councillor Pace has her hand raised and come back to this group maybe with some kind of recommendation, but um, happy to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I agree. I agree with what you're saying, Julie. The only um, entities that I would add to this are law enforcement from the different municipalities um, just so they could advise on, um, you know, the safety of it. So, for example, the design, the way it's designed could add to more safety or less safety. Um, and what would a law enforcement officer want to see on this trail to make uh, life easier for the people using the trail and also for any Leos that had to respond? That's the only other thing I'd add to this, but the, the list makes sense to me. The parks, the planning, engineering, management, all that makes sense. All of it is a lot. So, <laughs> so, I mean, if we have all of those groups represented, this could become a pretty big group. Um, So, so Julie, why don't um, why don't you and I sit down and kind of noodle through this a little bit? Yeah, I, I would okay. agree with you. Um, we don't need something that's unwieldy uh, from a size standpoint, but we need certainly, like I said, have some expertise at the table there. So, yeah, let's let's have those conversations, and and then maybe let's report back to this group with uh, recommendations. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Um, dude, let's see, where are we with time? 620. So we should um, see, I don't think we have anybody from the public. Can someone check and see if there's anyone here from the public? If not, we could go back to observations about your walk. So we ready, are we ready to do that? We don't have any public here. Yeah, I don't see anybody else. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay. Well, obviously, um, uh, we started our three-mile hike, and uh, we started in Cornelius, and 
walked all the way to um, to Hillsboro uh, to to First Street there in Maine or whatever that is. Um, but and it was a good walk. Um, but and it was kind of revealing it, to me. It was interesting. Uh, the Dairy Creek trestle wasn't where I thought it was. <laughs> so, uh, so walking across there was interesting. But uh, I would I would like to hear some comments of those who uh, went on there. And I know uh, sounds like maybe the mayor is not available. He was there. His city manager was there. Peter Brandom. We had Tom. Um, we had a good group. The army and. Um, so yeah, there's the, all the yahoos right there, but, um, um, so it was, it was a good walk. It was a cool day, a little bit of, a little bit of rain, but nothing terrible. Um, but it was interesting to walk, walk down the trail on this thing and see the variations of some of it was, uh, in some narrow, narrower spots and some of it was really quite wide. Um, so what are your thoughts? Uh, anybody that's on this meeting that uh, made the hike, I'd like to have some feedback knowing that we're going to go the other direction towards Forest Grove, and that's going to have much more complexities uh, for trail development there. And we can, we can certainly talk about that as we go down there. But for right now, any other comments? I, I just think it um, underscores the importance of actually going to see it because that makes a big difference. Um, you know, seeing it for the for me for the first time made all the difference and I really appreciate that. So I, you know, I think it's, I thought it was a good project before. I think it's even a better project now. I just haven't spoken with the gentleman, um, the gentleman that had the issue. I believe he's on Jerry as we turn the corner. Um, going down into Hillsboro. Um, his main concern was the homeless and making sure that they're not on the property and not going into his that area and his house. Um, those are the main concerns I'm hearing um, is the homeless and being able to um, keep it, keep track of that and make sure that they're not taking advantage of this trail, setting up camps on the sides, anything like that. And I know that with the time, place, manners everybody's putting in place, um, it's kind of kind of take away from that. But it also is going to be hidden. It's going to be not in the public. Like there's going to be areas where they are going to be able to hide more. And I, that was the biggest concern I was hearing the whole time from anybody um, that I talked to. But mainly that gentleman, um, you could tell he speaks for the area around him. Everybody that drove by was waving to him, talking to him. That was the biggest concern I heard. And I, I went I went back and talked to him for a good 10 minutes um, after everybody left. And I just let him vent. He just wanted to vent. He just wanted somebody to listen. And that's basically, that's what I gathered from me. He's, he's more concerned about the homeless getting into his area right there. Because his property is much right up to it. It makes sense why he'd be upset or why he'd be concerned. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. And uh, first and foremost, I have a major FOMO right now because I wasn't with the group. Uh, so, Julie, is it possible to Photoshop me into that photo? <laughs> <laughs> um, I do not have that skill, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. But anyway, Mike, I just uh, appreciate you for, you know, staying back and talking um, with that individual and just uh, that that's, that's fun. That's awesome. Um, you know, I think um, it'll be, I'm just so curious to see how uh, this, this will evolve. You know, I think there are, whole bunch of different corridor like uh um corridors like this throughout the region that have experienced really have a just a different relationship with the neighborhoods that they go through um you know i've i've seen neighborhoods that you know struggle with that issue um councilor marshall i've seen you know you also eventually you see neighborhoods also transform their backyard fences to being like open gates and you know it's just like your backyard becomes the trail and how and how people can interact as as neighbors so you know i'm hoping it's more on that end than you know than um uh and just kind of that that collective uh, embracing of the project and um 
Uh, anyway, so one of the questions that I did want to ask was how, you know, how our project team is engaging with other trails providers around this public safety issue and how, um, you know, the, some of the best practices that might be out there. I mean, I, I don't think that we should invest a lot of energy in recreating the wheel. Um, so just a, that's, that's my first thing and, and wondering if you need any help on that um, and how I can get some of our folks to support uh, the thought process there. Happy to help. Okay, thanks. So any other comments? Okay, well, um, the- They come back to us where cell coverage still works. <laughs> not knowing where you're heading uh we'll say that's good um i'm at, um, uh, Shehalem, I'm at the shehalem ridge uh we're having a, a scout barbecue for end of school year for our scout meeting so i that's why i had to get up here and get on it um i i think since uh juan carlos didn't get a chance to walk with this but maybe the others can correct me if i'm wrong on this but I, I think we've seen where a lot of the neighbors in the Cornelius section already have embraced the greenways on either side of the trail already, right? A lot of, a lot of people had gates in their back fences, um, had put in garden plots or landscaping between the rail, you know, the existing rail area and their, and their existing fence. So I think that's one of the things I'd be looking for us to understand moving forward um, is the community has already embraced this green space um, quite a bit, especially those that live right next to it. So how do we foster that continued interest, um, embracement of the area, that sense of ownership with the, the most positive manner forward to where those folks can still, you know, utilize that great space, right? There's a lot of gardens, there's, there's landscaping, all these things that have already been done so that we do something for the community, not to the community. So, but are they actually putting that, using that green space because there's not a trail there and the railroad is decommissioned? And I'm, I'm just playing devil's advocate. Is that the reason why they're using it? Are they still gonna want that, that, that fence going into that trail when more people are using it and using it as transportation going right next to their house? That's my concern, and that—that's what I worry about. Is I'm—I'm I'm just I'm—I'm I'm trying to play both sides here. I can see the value in it, but I can also definitely see the concern with these. Things. Um, it's going to be well used, and it's going to be going right through their backyard. Um, a number of people are asking, are they going to build a fence for me? Are they going to put a bigger fence up so people can't go over into my property? And those are valid concerns. No, and, and I don't mean to devalue that particular person's concerns, right? I think we need to, I think we need to look at partnering with the community instead of dictating to the community um, what is done in there, right? Because they have, you know, maybe that maybe they'll put a latch on the backside, maybe they'll lock it, maybe they won't. But I think until we engage the community and really bring them into this discussion. Uh, explicitly the part the property owners along there we won't know what their real interests or desires are you're right they may go you know what if you're going to have you know a hundred people a day walking through here i don't want to have a garden back here anymore i just like to be separated from it um but we won't know until we engage them and i think that's part of the process we've we've done this you know quick engagement process we've done surveys but we haven't gotten on the ground and really reached into all of those people and gone, hey, by the way, uh, your shed's got to move, buddy. At some point, we're gonna we're gonna have something through here. But also, the folks that are using it for a positive way, and the difference is having participated in Cornelius cleanups in that area for 20 years. Some of those gardens have been active for 20 years in there already, even when the rail was active. So I think I think we'll have to look at and discuss with the community what they really want to see how they want to see it used because it's it is there you, you hit it on the head it is their backyard it, i i think 
we're we're at time, so I want to be. More, I did have another short question. Maybe it is short. Maybe it's not. Jerry, up to you though. If you want to adjourn, I'll go right ahead, uh, Juan Carlos. We got a minute or two. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Actually, it's for uh, the uh, uh, Hillsborough. So, Councillor Pace, if you don't know, it's okay. But for the Crescent Greenway Trail that's going to be going through North, does it end close to this, or does it? I mean, where's the terminus for for that trail? Do you know? Um, it goes all the way to South Hillsboro. So if anything, it would cross over this trail. Okay, but I'd so have to look at a map, but it it um it it's actually a crescent. So it goes from North Hillsboro down to south. Yeah. Okay. So so, so, I'd, so I'd have to figure out exactly where it does that. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I'm that that's another great activation opportunity. So yeah, I, I, I think I think they do intersect. Um, or the idea is that they intersect. So Okay, well, that's that's a great question, Juan Carlos. We certainly want to incorporate as many um, options to this trail as we can. So that's that's a good idea. So, Julie, are we? Do you have enough information? Is there anything else we need to do to wrap this? No, I don't think so. Um, just a couple of quick next steps. On July twentieth, we'll be doing the same walk with I think the same walk, a walk with the tack. We haven't um, identified that yet, and I I did reach out to um, Councillor Gonzalez and Councillor Pace to invite you along since you weren't able to go, if that is um, interesting to you. Also, for future meetings, we'll be having more information on project design element refinements, the bridge analysis, and then more on this right-of-way ownership, easements, management, all this stuff we're talking about today. More to come. All right. All, all right. Well, that's that's good on the July 20 date, um, and uh, I I'm hoping that's a Friday because um, Friday afternoon seem to be the best for these kinds of things. It will. This one uh, was uh, our first one was a little bit less than three hours, so we kind of moved along. I would imagine the other uh, this one this July 20 walk will be a little longer because there's going to be more points for discussion, and uh, so. Uh, maybe, but I mean, three hours is a good time. So, you know, plan a one thirty to five or something like that. It'll be it'll be a good time spent. We'll end up in uh, in Forest Grove would be my guess, but we'll give you more details later. Just well, this this one is for the technical advisory committee. Oh, that's right. So this is TAC. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. Sorry. So, yep. if you do want me to schedule another one, we can work on that. We can Julie, can I talk to you after? I just want to get some logistics. Yeah, sure. Thanks, please. Yeah, sorry. I thought we I thought we were moving ahead on this. Um, so yeah, and we'll we'll orchestrate when that is. I mean, if it's not in July, it'll be, maybe be in August or something. We don't want to. We'll pick it when there's a heat dome or something. And it's 115 <laughs> degrees because you know we picked it on the day that it, first day that it rained in like two weeks, and so uh, so yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Jerry, it sounds like the uh, the JPAC trip. We had a a bike a bike trip scheduled, and then historic wildfire smoke clouded the city, oh. and it was unhealthy to be outside. I was like, really? It was insane. Anyway, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time, certainly, and investment in this project. It's going to be great. We're going to look forward to this. So, um, so thanks, everybody, and we are adjourned. Enjoy the evening. Thank you.